Hi, and welcome back to Listening Week. Uh, we're aware that we're having a few problems for our Facebook channel viewers. We're going to try and get those sorted out as soon as possible. Uh, but for now, hi to everybody joining us on our YouTube channel. And if you joined the live session yesterday, you'll know that we looked at the listening skills you're going to need to develop for success in OET and the workplace. And the recording of that session is now available on both our Facebook and YouTube channels at Official OET. And I also shared the link to the sample listening test that we'll be diving into for the next three sessions, starting today with listening part A. And if you tried that uh, listening test after yesterday's session, or you've already tried it in advance of today's session, let me know in the chat how you found it. Uh, on a scale of one to five, one being not very confident that you got more than 32 questions correct, or five being really confident that you got more than 32 questions correct, let me know in the chat. 32 questions correct, of course, is the number that we recommend you're consistently scoring in official practice tests before you consider booking your test. And we'll also post the link to that sample test into the chat for you now so that you can, if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that sample test before, you can get that downloaded while um, the candidates online are letting me know in chat how they felt about this sample test. You can have a look um, with us as we go through listening part A live today. And then before tomorrow and Thursday sessions, you can have a go at listening and uh, listening part B and C by yourself. All right, so uh, let me have a look at the chat. Um, and I'm just going to pop that link for you into the chat as well. Um, uh, all right. Let's pop that in there. Uh, and let's see, what are the comments coming through? Um, threes and fours um, are the most common answers coming through. So, so people are somewhat confident, which is really great to see. Um, you're feeling good about uh, the, having got more than 32 answers correct in, uh, in this sample test. So. Let's have a look uh, together on listening part A. And as a quick reminder, um, we're going to be doing part A today and we'll look at listening part B and listening part C uh, over the next two days. And on Friday, we're going to bring that all together, uh, looking at building on tips and skills you've learned during the week. Uh, so it'll be great if you can join me for all of these remaining sessions. So uh, before today's session, a few weeks ago, we gave candidates the opportunity to have a go at this new sample test before it went live on the OET website. And these candidates kindly submitted their responses um, into us here at OET. And you can see uh, from the image on the screen uh, where all of the candidates came from. Uh, it was really great to have so many uh, different countries represented. It gave, gave us a really global feeling to the results that we were getting in from candidates in advance. And we looked at 60 responses coming in from candidates around the world. And I'll be using statistics and actual answers given by those candidates throughout today's session. If you're one of those candidates, I hope you're excited to learn how you did with your answers. Oh, and another thing that's worth hanging around for, for the next three days, we've got a prize giveaway, thanks to our friends at Cambridge University Press and Assessment, who've given us e-copies of their new book, OET Trainer, which was published a little bit earlier this year, and we'll be holding the giveaway at the end of today's session, and all the questions will be about listening part A, so make sure you're paying attention to be in with a chance of winning one of those brand new copies later. All this week, we've also got a discount offer for our OET listening course using the code that you can see on the screen now. And I will share more details of that later too. But it is possible that today uh, we've got some candidates joining us who are completely new to OET, in which case, welcome. 
or we've got students who are trying out listening part A for the first time. So for you, let's quickly go over the basics about what happens in this test. And those of you who are really familiar with it can show off your knowledge. So I've put all of the facts about listening part A into code. If I tell you that 40M stands for 40 minutes, see if you can break the rest of my code. So here it is coming up on your screen now. Can you tell me what the rest of those lines stand for? Tell me in chat, um, what do you think 2A stand for? It's a fact to do with listening part A. 24Q, that one should be quite easy to answer. Tell me in chat what you think that stands for. The other ones might be slightly more tricky, but see how you go. Some of them will know, some of you will know uh, listening part A really well and you'll be able to um, uh, answer that code quite quickly. All right, that's great. So um, RJ is saying two audio recordings. That looks like a good answer. We've got a few people, Shraddha, Samina, Katrin, all saying 24 questions for 24Q. A few people saying 30 seconds. 30 seconds for what though? It's not all done in 30 seconds, you'll be pleased to hear. Just give you another 20 seconds, see if you can answer some of those later questions. Matthias is suggesting maybe 30 seconds per answer. Nalija saying 30 seconds to look at the text. Great. All right. Well done. Lots of good answers coming through. So um, listening part A does last for approximately 40 minutes. And there are two audios, um, which are consultations between a healthcare professional and a patient or carer. So great. You got that one correct. And there are 24 questions in total. Most of you got that one right. 12 questions per audio. Before each audio plays, you have 30 seconds to read the consultation notes and there is one question type. So QT stood for one question type. So all of uh, the answers for listening part A are filling in with a word or phrase the notes that the healthcare professional has um, made uh, using words that you hear in the audio. And that last part is really important. Now, I'm just having a quick look back to see if anyone's had a go at the last two pieces of code. Doesn't look like it, but that's OK. So 4S stands for four speakers. So in total, in listening part A, you will hear four speakers, two speakers in each audio. And the last piece of code is that two of those voices will be male and two of those voices are female. And that makes it easier for you to distinguish between those voices. So in each audio, two of the speakers, one will be male and one will be female so that it's really easy for you to tell who is talking. And the instructions for each consultation mention the profession and the name of the patient or carer that they're speaking to. And while this profession might be the same or it might be different to your own, there's no advantage or disadvantage to this as the questions have been carefully written to ensure they can't be guessed. So all candidates need to listen carefully to the audio to hear and record the correct answers using words you hear in the audio. So let's start by looking at extract one together. Extract one is a consultation between a primary care doctor and patient Haley Dove. And the approach that you're going to take 
for extract one and listening part A is to use the 30 seconds before each audio plays to scan through the notes, looking for the different segments that show the structure of the conversation. In this case, background to the condition, development of new symptoms and treatment, and current concerns. And then you're going to look at the clues that are provided about the answers from the words around the gap. Now, this is quite small, so let's look at question one in much more detail and in a much bigger size as well. So if we look at question one, we can see that we're looking for the middle word uh, from a list of three symptoms related to endometriosis. The dash shows that this note uh, is linked to the line above, which is where the patient mentions that she's had endometriosis for many years. And we have bloating, gap, fatigue. So the missing word will be something that connects with these other two words. Let's look at question two. We can tell from the word pain, which is after the gap, that we will be listening for an adjective to describe pain. Now, this could be uh, an adjective to describe a type of pain. So, for example, dull or twisting or a place in the body where you might experience pain. Now, I want you to tell me about gaps three to six. I don't want you to tell me the answer if you've already had a go at these uh, answers these questions. We're going to check the answers in a minute. I want you to imagine that you're within the 30 seconds before the audio starts for the first time. You've not seen this sample test before. You've got 30 seconds to read these questions. What can you tell about the missing word or phrase just from the words around it? So what type of word is it? Knowing that most answers for part A are going to either be nouns or adjectives, and what category of word is it? So is it, for example, a symptom? Is it a body part? So as an example, what I want you to put in chat for me is, uh, for example, it's a noun and it's a job title. And I can see some great answers already coming through. So that's fantastic. We've got occupation, profession. Um, we've got Katina suggesting for number four, it's a medical issue. Um, Shraddha is suggesting that um, number five is a type of surgery. Um, that's great. Um, Nilija is saying for five, a procedure. Arun is suggesting number four is a disease. Absolutely. Some good options coming through here. What about number six? What do you think um, about number six? Matthias is suggesting number six could be a profession. Again, um, Nilija is suggesting it could be the name of the business that she started. Katina, the job. Absolutely excellent work. Really impressed with those responses. So let's have a look. Uh, like you've suggested, number four is going to be the name of a medical condition. It's going to be a noun. Uh, number five, quite similarly, it's this time a medical procedure, but also a noun. And question six, also a noun. As I've mentioned, most answers in listening part A are either nouns or adjectives. And this time we're thinking it could be a job title. So before we've even listened, we already know a lot about uh, the answer that we're listening for. And this means that we can filter out the irrelevant information and filter in on the information that provides that answer that we are anticipating. So here are the answers for questions one to six. So if you've already had a go at the sample test, you can now check your answers for those first six questions. And let's look with those answers to those anticipations that we've just discussed. So the first answer is nausea, and we suggested that it was going to be another symptom linked to endometriosis. So nausea is a symptom. That's a good match. For question two, we thought it could be an adjective to describe pain or location. In this case, 
uh, the answer was uh, an adjective to describe location of pain. So that was also a good match. Question three, most of you were suggesting, was going to be um, a, a job title. I added the extra detail that the job title would start uh, with a consonant because we had um, the, the article a uh, in front of it, which tells us that it's going to be uh, a consonant starting. Um, preschool teacher matches with that. Uh, for number four, you said a medical condition. Yes, absolutely. Medical procedure, also correct for number five. And number six, again, you were suggesting a job title. So all of these answers matched very well with those anticipations uh, that you had uh, before you listened. So it proves to you that that exercise in the 30 seconds that you have with those 12 answers before you listen can help you a lot uh, to know what you're going to be listening for. And you can see um, that 30% of those submitting their answers in advance got all six answers correct. Now, you might think that's quite a small number. Um, of those who answered with wrong answers, in the majority of cases, it wasn't because they had the wrong word um, or they had misunderstood the audio. It was clear from their answers uh, that they had actually identified the correct word or phrase what made their answer wrong was because their answers weren't accurate enough. And let me show you why that might have been the case. So for three of those answers in the first six questions, you can see that three of them have brackets around part of it. So bouts of in answer one, uh, the hyphen in answer three, and a uh, in answer five are optional. So if you included those words, if you included bouts of, if you included the hyphen, if you included a, or if you didn't include those words, the answer is correct in both cases. The answer is optional. But all other words need to be included for you to get the correct answer. So if you didn't include the word teacher from question three, or you only wrote the word teacher from question three, or you only wrote cancer for question four, your answer is incorrect and you score zero for that answer. And for the purposes of this sample test, and as a general recommendation when you are preparing for OET, if your answer wasn't a perfect match for the answer key, mark it wrong. There aren't any half marks in, in OET. So rather than you sort of saying to yourself, well, I almost got it correct, be strict, okay? Um, you didn't get it right in the sample test. So there's a good chance that you would make perhaps a similar mistake in your live test. You want a realistic idea of how many questions you get correct whenever you take an official sample test. So mark it wrong if it wasn't correct as per the answers that I'm showing you on the screen now. And while there might be some accurate, uh, sorry, there might be some flexibility with the accuracy of your answers in listening part A when it comes to the spelling, you won't know for your particular test uh, what that flexibility is and for which answers that flexibility can be applied. So it's best to play it safe and work on your accuracy before your test so that it doesn't need to be a concern for you on test day. We'll come back to working on common spelling rules in a few minutes, but I want to pick out one word in particular. All of the words in questions one to six are familiar both to a lay person and a healthcare professional. 32% of candidates who submitted in advance made a spelling mistake with hysterectomy. If this was you, you need to find something memorable about the word to help you to remember the correct spelling for another time. For example, that the word includes two Ys. But also make sure you're pronouncing the word correctly, as this can also impact your spelling. Let's listen to the patient, Haley saying this word as part of her statement that covers answer five. The hysterectomy. All right, that was really quick, but you should be able to hear that she pronounces each of those sounds individually. She says hysterectomy. 
And apart from the first Y that caught some of you out, um, the other syllables are written as they are pronounced. And I would make a guess that those of you who missed the first E also pronounce the word without an E. So for example, you will pronounce the word hysterectomy. And that's a reason why you don't spell hyst hysterectomy correctly, because you're not pronouncing hysterectomy, you're saying hysterectomy. If this is the case, and then there is help for you in better pronouncing the word, which will also help you recognize the word more easily when you hear it, and probably help you learn to spell it too. And that is something called Uglish. And in Uglish, we're putting the link into chat now, you can type in a word or phrase, and you'll be given a series result of results taken from YouTube, um, where speakers saying this word or phrase um, are recorded in a sentence. So I'm going to play you a quick example with just a few of the um, speakers saying the word hysterectomy. Turns out they just decided it was time for a hysterectomy too, because you already had four kids. Particularly notable in, notable in hysterectomy, where again, they were going home quite a bit earlier and much better outcomes. Is the treatment for PMDD a hysterectomy? Pause or removing the uterus and ovaries entirely in a hysterectomy. She's hiding from him that she's planning on having a hysterectomy because she has uterine fibroids. In delivery and then undergo a hysterectomy after one to two childbirths to remove the donor uterus. All right. So. That's just one example, and you can see that there are over 200 different examples of sh short video snippets of people saying hysterectomy from all around the world. You can select US accents, UK accents, Australian accents, Canadian, New Zealand, Irish accents. So you can get a full range of people pronouncing a, a word that you're finding difficult uh, to pronounce, to recognize when you're hearing it from this excellent website. So do check that out after today's session. And here are the answers for questions 7 to 12. Um, again, it was clear from the answers of those submitting in advance that they'd identified the correct answer, but they'd not been accurate enough in their recording of the answer. And question 9 and 10 are really good examples of this. In both instances, 7% and 20% of students respectively had written a word that has a completely different meaning to the one intended. So they had written adapted for question nine with an A, not an O in the middle, and scaring as opposed to scarring, scarring having a double R and scaring having one R. So if you were somebody who made this mistake too, I would suggest a few of these remedies. So number one, record yourself saying the statement from the audio. I was adopted as a baby and I'm left with quite a bit of scarring on the arm. And then compare your pronunciation with Uglish examples. Are you clearly saying adopted and scarring? This will help you uh, learn to hear those words more clearly if you are pronouncing them right, and that will also assist you with your spelling. Tip two, during the time allowed for checking answers, ensure your answers make sense in the context of the statement. So imagine you are another healthcare professional reading these notes after your consultation with no prior knowledge of the patient. Would they be able to understand the meaning? And thirdly, review common spelling rules for words ending with ing or ed. For both these endings, the rule is that words that finish vowel consonant before the ending is added, the consonant gets doubled. And that's why scar becomes scarring with a double R. Run, running, swim, swimming, sit, sitting. They all follow this same spelling pattern.
So before we move on to extract two, how did you do with extract one? How many questions did you get correct in total for extract one? Let me know out of 12 in the chat how many you were getting correct. The average for the 60 candidates submitting answers in advance was nine. So anything above nine is fantastic. I was very strict uh, when marking these answers though. So anything that wasn't correct, whether that was spelling or incomplete answers was marked wrong. Hopefully you're doing the same for yourself as well. So only give yourself the mark if your answer was completely correct. That's great to see some really high scores coming through. So we've got some 12s. Um, a couple of people saying 11 or 12, um, or maybe 11 out of 12. Sorry, I understand. I was going to say there isn't um, an either or option. Um, but uh, yes, if you've got uh, 11 out of 12, 10 out of 12, um, I can see somebody's asking a question, what if we write scar on the arm? Uh, Pallavi, that would be marked wrong. Um, it doesn't fit with the um, with the, the gap. You need to have the whole word scarring. That is what is said on the audio. All right. Well done. Really high scores I can see coming through. Nobody got anything less than the nine coming out of those uh, submitting in advance. So that's great. Let's move on to extract two. So in extract two, we are listening to a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Marvin Cheney. And you might not know much about the work of a physiotherapist or a physical therapist as they're known in North America, other than that they help patients with mobility and rehabilitation. But if we look at the sections of the um, notes, um, as you will do in the 30 seconds before you hear the audio play, you'll notice that they're very similar to those in extract one. The headings, onset of symptoms, post-COVID symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, current concerns, these are all very similar to the ones that we saw between the doctor and the patient in extract one. And this is partly because all healthcare professionals would start working with a new patient by gathering more details about their reason for presenting and their history. So even the unfamiliar can still feel familiar. So remember to use the strategy we tried together for extract one before you listen, using the clues provided by the words around the gaps in the 30 seconds you have before the audio starts. So let's look at question 13 together and do this. Remember, the notes that you're reading are those a healthcare professional would write. So they're going to use more technical language than a patient does. For example, patients don't talk about contracting illnesses. They use simpler words. For example, I got COVID or I came down with COVID or I caught COVID. And so you need to be ready to hear different words to those that are written, but still have the same meaning. There aren't a lot of additional clues that we can use from the rest of the words other than no hospital admission, meaning his condition wasn't serious enough to require hospitalisation. So now we've had a think about the gap. Let's listen to Marvin. Yeah, sure. It all started when I caught COVID-19. I mean, I hadn't been vaccinated, so maybe it was worse than it might have been, but who knows. Anyway, I had it pretty bad, but not bad enough to go to the hospital. I had the usual flu-like symptoms that turned into a dry cough. All right. Now, I know most of you know the answer and answered it correctly, but for those new to OET, I want to go through the strategy a bit more carefully first. So we hear Marvin say, I caught COVID, which fits, as I suggested, with the lay language patients use and the technical language used by healthcare professionals to record it. Then he says, I hadn't been vaccinated, so maybe it was worse than it might have been, but who knows? Anyway, I had it pretty bad, but not bad enough to go to the hospital. 
hospital is our trigger word. It shows we've hit the words after the gap. So that's the bit of the audio that we're working on, anything before the word hospital. And after um, Marvin mentions that he caught COVID. So from what we've just heard, there are now two choices uh, that would fit with wasn't before the gap. And those are vaccinated and bad enough. But I want you to tell me in chat, why is vaccinated correct and bad enough incorrect? OK, so the correct answer is vaccinated. Why is that correct and why is bad enough incorrect? Let me know in chat. What do you think? Why is bad enough not the correct answer? Okay, Heida and Yushio are making some suggestions. Bad enough fits with wasn't. You can say something wasn't bad enough. So that's not the issue. Katina is closer. Katina is suggesting no hospital admission explains that it's not bad enough. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. All right, so the reason that vaccinated is correct and bad enough is incorrect is that you need to think like a healthcare professional. This is a test for healthcare professionals. Vaccinated is a precise, relevant piece of information that a healthcare professional is likely to record on a consultation note. Bad enough is vague. And as Katina suggests, it as part of the phrase, it actually acts as a synonym for no hospital admission. It wasn't bad enough to go to the hospital. 10% um, of those who submitted answers in advance wrote bad enough or bad. If this was you, remember the task is to complete the healthcare professional's notes in a way that a healthcare professional would write them and they value the recorded information if they were going to refer to them again in the future. So vaccinated is the correct answer. Here are the questions for answers 14 to 16. These didn't cause very many problems. Um, so I'm going to move on to question 17, which caused similar problems to question 13, although some students uh, were writing a whole phrase this time instead of precise language that we've just seen is favoured by healthcare professionals. Here are some examples of what candidates who were submitting in advance um, put as their answers. So we can see words on tip of tongue, words beyond tongue, words cannot come out from mouth, weird words, wo words won't come out, certain words, and even dysphasic. Let's listen to what Marvin actually says, because remember, as I said at the beginning of tonight's session, only a word or phrase heard in the audio is the correct answer. Anything else will score you zero. And I start to get this thing where I couldn't remember stuff. Like words would be on the tip of my tongue, but just wouldn't come out. I mean, that was weird. The only part of what Marvin says, and you can see on the screen the whole statement that Marvin made, the only word that a healthcare professional would find relevant is words. Everything else is just subjective patient speak. The healthcare professional doesn't need to recall what it feels like to the patient, just that he was finding himself forgetting words. As well, the instructions for part A are to record a word or phrase that you hear in the audio 
and you don't need to make, in fact, you must not make any changes to what you hear. This means that on the tip of my tongue, to be included, which in itself would make the answer much, much longer than an answer that is ever used in OET, you would also have to include the word would be uh, so that you're meeting the test instructions. Because if you remove the words would be and just write words on the tip of my tongue, you have not recorded um, a phrase that you hear in the audio. You've changed it and changes are not uh, allowed for listening part A. Answers are always short in listening part A as well, usually one or two words only. So uh, if you're tempted to write a longer answer, uh, look again at those words that you've written down and perhaps focus in on the words that are relevant to a healthcare professional. Remove anything that sounds subjective. And this leads us to question 18. Now, my question to you here is, can a patient have a single palpitation? Or perhaps before you answer that, if a patient can, would a patient ever recognize that they had had a single palpitation or report it? To me, I don't think so. Patients report when they are having palpitations. So it's a repeated event. Listen to Marvin say it. And when I started to get palpitations and chest pains, I went to see the doctor. The S is quite clearly pronounced in what Marvin says. And again, if this is something that you struggle with, you can listen to it on Uglish. You can type in palpitations and hear lots of different voices saying it with the S clearly pronounced. 52% of the students submitting their answers in advance missed the S off the answer. And this would make their answer incorrect and score them zero. You are expected to know that palpitations should be written as a plural noun. It's not something that can happen in a singular form. So if you have written palpitation, then you need to score your answer zero. Be firm, be strict with yourself. It comes in handy later because if you learn the lesson now, you're not going to make the same mistake in your test. All right, questions 21 to 23 were answered correctly in the main. Uh, so let's finish off by looking at question 24. And we know from the bullet points that came a little bit earlier um, in the notes that the patient's talking about fitness and exercise. He said that he likes yoga and Tai Chi. And at the beginning of what we can see on the screen, he'd like to resume going to the gym, um, but he would like some advice about use, about use of gap and light weights. So the clues from this gap tell us that we're thinking about a piece of equipment that you find in a gym that isn't weights. Uh, so if I think back to the times when I've been in a gym, I can think of some machines for running, bikes, rowing machines, other pieces of equipment um, that uh, might be something that Marvin is going to say in the audio. But this answer caused difficulty for 47% of the students who submitted their answers in advance. So let's listen to Marvin again. I would like to start going to the gym again, though I'm aware that I shouldn't do anything too strenuous. So I was hoping to get some guidance on strength building exercises. I mean, should I be using things like resistance bands or even trying light weights? It would be really good to do things like that, but I feel I need to do it under someone's guidance at the moment. All right. And if we look at the words of what he uh, said, um, it doesn't seem to be Marvin's accent that caused the issue, as the other answers that were being submitted that were incorrect rhymed with his pronunciation of bands. So we were getting resistance fans or resistance pans. It is a worthwhile strategy to make a guess uh, rather than leaving an answer blank. So even if you thought it extremely unlikely the answer was fans or pans, 
if you couldn't work out what the missing word was, then it's definitely better to write something than nothing. But you would have scored zero for this answer. As I mentioned yesterday, natural English speech can make the word boundaries difficult to hear. So it sounds more like resistance bands. And said like this, the f and the b sound quite similar. And perhaps it's just that you've never heard of resistance bands before, but they are a popular tool for rehabilitation. They're not just used in gyms. And from these pictures on the screen, you probably would recognize them. All right, so how did you do in extract two? How does your score compare to the average from the 60 candidates who submitted in advance? Slightly lower than for extract one, the average score was eight out of 12. How did you do? Did you score more than that? Did you score about the same? Tell me in chat. Yeah, that's great. So Laura saying nine, Asiya nine, Tanoja eight, Jaden 10, Christine 10, Safak 11. That's great. Some really good scores. Hayda 10, JJ nine. Great. So there were a few mistakes obviously coming through. Um, but as I said, uh, this is the time to learn and to avoid those mistakes for the future. So congratulations uh, with your scores, um, particularly those who got um, 10 or more out of 12. If you didn't score 100%, here are my top pieces of advice for you to work on for the next time you attempt a sample test or need to record something a patient or colleague is saying to you. So number one, use the time before the audio starts to check out the section headings to get an understanding of what the consultation will be about and use the clues around the gap to start anticipating what type of word and category of word you're listening to. In many cases, as we saw earlier in the session, your anticipations will be correct and they will help you recognize the answer when it's said in the audio. Tip two, think like a healthcare professional and write answers that are precise and relevant. You don't need to include additional thoughts and feelings given by the patient. So for example, a bit of or pretty or idioms. Your answers should be a word or phrase that you hear and that would make sense to you if you were to review those notes again in a month or if a colleague were to review them without having spoken to the patient at all. Tip three, most answers will be a noun or an adjective and only one or two words in length. So from those two extracts in this sample test, I can tell you that 16 of the 24 answers were all single word answers, one word answers, and the rest were two words long, if you wrote words with a hyphen, two words long. So 20 answers out of 24 were nouns or noun phrases and the other four were adjectives. So that is a real indication of what you're looking for, what you're listening for, what you're looking to record as your answer. Short answers that are generally nouns or adjectives. Tip four, use the time given to check your answers for sense. Does it make sense with what you anticipated about the gap and the other words around it? Have you spelled your answers correctly? Have you used plural S when needed? If you only wrote part of the answer, can you fill in the rest during that time that you're checking your answers? And lastly, can uh, make sure you remember that natural English speech pushes the boundaries of separate words together or removes some of the sounds. And this can make words you're very familiar with uh, sound different when you see them, when you hear them, as opposed to when you see them written down. Listening to the pronunciation of words as part of a statement can make you feel more comfortable with connected speech and being able to recognize individual word boundaries. Now we're putting into the chat now our complete guide to listening part A, which is a great resource that you can use um, to get more tips and strategies. 
And we'll be sharing the sample test plus all of the answer key and the script at the end of the session. Um, so that you can, uh, sorry, at the end of this week, uh, once we've gone through listening part B and listening part C, we'll be sharing the answers to all parts of the test. Uh, so you can either look back at this session to see some of those answers um, or wait till the end of the week to get the full answer key provided. So we're nearly at the end of the session, but we have one more important thing to do before we finish, and that is the prize giveaway. And our friends at Cambridge University Press and Assessment have offered us two copies of their brand new OET trainer books. And we're giving away two copies over the next three days. So two copies each day, six in total. So if you join the session every day, you have three opportunities to get your hands on one of the copies. And these OET trainers contain six complete sample tests, including step-by-step -step training, hints and tips for test-taking techniques, downloadable answer keys with explanations of why answers are right or wrong, audios and further exercises. And the winners will be able to receive the nursing or medicine version and we'll email them all the details to access their ebook version. The books retail at Australian $56, so this is a great prize. All right, that's enough talk let us start the quiz. So to enter, go to kahoot.it. We're posting the link into the chat now and type in the pin uh, that you can see on the screen. So I'm going to share the screen now to the Kahoot. The pin is that big number that you can see at the top of the screen and we've posted into chat the link that you need to join. So once you've joined, put in your um, name, uh, and get ready to play. There's five questions. They're all about um, listening part A and what we've discussed in today's session. So if you've been listening carefully, you have a great chance of uh, winning. So I'll just give uh, another minute for you all to join and uh, then we will get started. All right. Got 20 people joined already, 100 people in the session at the moment. So uh, if you're looking how to play, use the link that's in the chat now and then type in the game pin, that really big number you can see on the top of the screen into uh, the, the, the Kahoot site as it opens, put in your name and uh, you, you should see yourself coming up on the screen very shortly. All right, we've got 36 people in now. Let's see, I'm going to wait until we've got at least 50 in and then we will get started. So let's let a few more people in. And we'll get going. All right, we've hit 50, so let's get started. Very easy to play. You will play on your phone. You'll see the question on the screen and you will choose um, the answer that is the best match to that question. Here we go. So the first question, multiple choice. How many speakers will you hear in total in part A? One, two, three, or four. Very easy question, very easy answer. You get extra points for answering fast as well as obviously being accurate. So you've got five seconds left. Get your answers in. The correct answer is four. You will hear four speakers in total in part A, two in each extract. Let's see how people went with that question. Well done to Ushio, who is top of the leaderboard right now. It can all change. Let's go to question two. Question two, how many seconds do you have to read the consultation notes before each part A audio starts? 15, 30, 60 or 90? How many seconds for each extract do you have before the consultation audio starts? 
15, 30, 60, or 90. Five seconds left. The correct answer is two. Most of you got that correct, or the B is the correct answer. 30 seconds is correct. Let's see what that did to the leaderboard. Kun has gone up to second, first place. Second place is Cecilia. Well done. Let's go to question three. This one's a little bit more tricky. Which profession was the person conducting the consultation in extract two? A doctor, an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, or a radiographer? What was the profession of the person conducting the consultation in extract two? Five seconds left. Well done, all of you that chose physiotherapist. That was the person conducting the consultation. What's that done to our leaderboard? No change at the top. Kun is still uh, number one, but there are two prizes to give away for uh, today. So, Hani, you're also in with a chance of winning. Let's go to question four, which is worth double points. So a real chance for you to come from behind. Which of these adjectives is not, not a good description of your answers for part A? Relevant, precise, vague, short. Which of those is not a good descriptor? I've said not quite a few times there. Hopefully that's giving you a clue. That's right. Well done, all of those those of you who chose vague, you're looking for relevant, precise and short answers for listening part A, you are not listening for vague answers. So how has that changed the leaderboard? Oh, no change at the top. Kun is still sitting pretty at the moment. Cecilia has come back up to second place. So last question, see how you get on with this one. From sample test five, how many words were most frequently used in each answer? How many words in length? One, two, three, or more than three? How many words were most of the answers? One word long, two word long, three words long, or more than three words long? And the answer was one. Yes, most of those, uh, I think I said uh, 16 out of 24 were all one word long. So let's see, get ready. If you are the winner, you'll need to take a screenshot of you uh, in your poll position. So unluckily, number three, Anifanti, you just missed out today, but well done. Number two, Jani, take a picture. You're in with a chart to get a prize and number one, Cecilia came from second place. Well done, Cecilia, Jani, both take a screenshot of your position. And I'm going to ask you to email that through to us here at oeteducation at oet.com.au. Well done to our two winners. Remember, we've got two more chances for you to win uh, tomorrow and Thursday. And for those of you that missed out on that, uh, but would like to get started on improving your listening skills, um, we've got the details of our listening skills course, which we're offering a 20% discount for all week. Um, the listening skills course also offers really effective listening practice, including detailed lessons covering the skills and strategies for each part of the test. You can challenge yourself with six new part A's, 16 part B's and six part C's. And we've also got the transcripts and extended answer keys that you can review from. So we're posting the link to uh, that course in chat now. Head on over to the link to claim your 20% off. You just need to use the code listening20 when you come to the payment page. And talking of tomorrow, I hope you'll be able to join me again uh, when we're going to be looking at part B. Unfortunately, our Facebook connection was down for today, but we will post the video onto our Facebook page after the session and we'll make sure that the session uh, goes live across both Facebook and YouTube tomorrow. 
If you want to have a go at sample parts B and C questions before tomorrow, here's the link uh, to the sample test uh, that you can work on tomorrow. And thanks for joining in today. Your enthusiasm is always in answering the questions. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye for now.